Hello everyone and welcome to QuickMed where medicine is explained quickly and easily. In this video we will go over celiac disease, we'll cover what features patients will present with, how to diagnose celiac disease, as well as end with a practice question. So let's get to it. Let's start with the definition of celiac disease. Celiac disease is an immune-mediated inflammatory disease of the small intestine and it's important to know that it's in the small intestine and it's due to an environmental agent known as gluten. And so what is gluten exactly? It is a structural protein that is naturally found in grains, which include wheat, spelt, barley, and rye. So when patients with celiac disease are exposed to one of these grains, they will oftentimes present with a variety of symptoms. The most classic symptoms include diarrhea and malabsorption. The diarrhea is going to be chronic in nature, and patients can also have symptoms like abdominal pain, bloating, and flatulence along with this. Malabsorption occurs here because celiac disease is an inflammatory disorder that disrupts the lining of the small intestine, and so that affects absorption along with it. And in particular, fat absorption can be affected, and so this leads to steatorrhea or fatty stools. But look out for terms like bulky stools, floating stools, or foul-smelling stools because those terms are often used to describe steatorrhea on a test question. And along with this, patients can also have weight loss because of the difficulty with absorption, as well as different nutrient and vitamin deficiencies. We're going to go over three in particular, and I want you to keep these in mind because these are very high yield for test questions. So the first deficiency that I want you to know is iron deficiency, and this happens because iron is absorbed primarily in the duodenum as well as the proximal jejunum. Vitamin deficiency, particularly vitamin D deficiency, occurs because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin and so it will be affected in this case. Hypocalcemia can also occur because of impaired absorption of vitamin D itself, and also because of the binding of intraluminal calcium to unabsorbed fatty acids. And along with these findings, patients can also present with a skin condition known as dermatitis herpetiformis, and it's actually so strongly associated with celiac disease that it's considered a classic symptom of celiac disease, so keep this in mind. Dermatitis herpetiformis is when you get these very itchy papules or vesicles, that are often presented in a symmetric distribution along the scalp, shoulders, elbows, and knees. So if you're presented with a picture that looks like this on a test question, really think of celiac disease here. The name herpetiformis is included here because the skin rash often has a tendency to present as blisters that appear in clusters, and so this represents a herpes infection when it's actually not. Let's now move on to the diagnosis of celiac disease beginning with serologic testing. Our single preferred test is a tissue transglutaminase antibody level. And this is because this test is very highly sensitive and highly specific compared with other labs that we have available. Alternative tests that are also available and which you might see on your test questions include an anti-endomycele antibody level as well as an anti-deaminated gliadin peptide antibody level. And gliadin here is actually a component of gluten, and so we're checking an antibody level that is directed against that antigen in this case here. Along with serologic testing, the next step in our evaluation would be a biopsy, and we would do this if we have any positive serology or negative serology, but still a very high clinical suspicion for celiac disease. A biopsy is truly your confirmatory test for celiac disease, and the findings can range from mild to severe, but on a test question, you will most likely see a very severe case of celiac disease when presented with a histologic slide. Within the small intestine, there are these tiny hair-like projections known as villi, and what they basically do is increase the surface area to allow for adequate absorption of nutrients. But in celiac disease, as we said, there is inflammation in the small intestine, and this leads to a loss of that villi. So you'd see a flattening of villi on histology. As you can see in this slide here, there is a complete loss of villi, whereas normally you would see many, many projections there. Let's now go over a practice question to solidify our understanding. Here we have a 31-year-old man who presents to the clinic because of a three-month history of diarrhea and flatulence. He has had a 30-pound weight loss over this time period. He does not follow any restricted diet and his vital signs are normal. Fecal occult blood test is negative, and an upper endoscopy with biopsy shows atrophy of duodenal villi. Concurrent serological studies will most likely reveal which of the following. So this test question is really a two-part question. It's asking you to identify what the diagnosis is, as well as figure out what the lab results would show. So let's go over the key features of this test question. Here we have a three-month history of diarrhea and flatulence, so a chronic presentation of GI symptoms that are consistent with celiac disease. There's also chronic weight loss, which shows that there is some component of malabsorption that is occurring at this time. We know that the patient does not follow any restricted diet, so he's likely getting exposed to gluten. 
And in this test question, they actually give you the confirmatory test, which is an upper endoscopy, which shows atrophy of duodenal villi. So just based on this test question alone, the correct answer here is celiac disease. But now we need to know what serological studies would we find here. The correct answer here is going to be E, antibodies to tissue transglutaminase, as we discussed earlier, which is your first line or your preferred test for diagnosing celiac disease. Let's now go over why the other answer choices are incorrect. Choice A here will be found in rheumatoid arthritis, and this is where you have patients that present with symmetric, tender, swollen, warm joints of the hands and wrists primarily, and so this is not something that we're seeing here. H. pylori typically presents with gastric and duodenal ulcers, and on biopsy, you actually would find H. pylori, and so this is not the correct answer. Choice C, which is your anti-mitochondrial antibodies, is found in patients with primary biliary cirrhosis, or PBC. This is an autoimmune condition that most commonly affects older females, and it involves the intrahepatic biliary tract. So in this case, you can see fat malabsorption and steatorrhea, which is what we also find in celiac disease. But in this question, the endoscopic evaluation really points towards celiac disease because you have the atrophy of the duodenal villi, which is not something that you would see in PBC. And then anti-smooth muscle antibodies are commonly seen in autoimmune hepatitis, and this typically affects females more than males. And then patients will often have symptoms like jaundice, which we do not see here. All right, so we went over celiac disease. We talked about how patients can present with weight loss, diarrhea, and flattening of the villi on biopsy. Look out for antibodies like anti-tissue transglutaminase or anti-TTG, anti-endomyceal antibodies, and then also your anti-gliadin antibody that we mentioned earlier. Make sure to keep these antibody names in mind because they are all fair game for the test questions and we hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe so that we can keep doing what we're doing and as always, good luck studying everyone.